So current Minnesota Timberwolves owner Glenn Taylor had a fallout with Mark Laurie and Alice Rodriguez, two business partners that were trying to make the purchase of the Minnesota Timberwolves. And this whole situation is a series of conundrums where it touches different aspects of the economy, the tech world, as well as the business world, and of course sports. But we'll go over this layer by layer as we'll hear directly from Alice Rodriguez and Mark Laurie as well as someone who used to formally do business with Alice Rodriguez when he tried to purchase the Florida Marlins. And finally, we'll hear directly what Adam Silver had to say in regards to the manner. But the way things are playing out in public in regards to these two parties, it gives us a rare look into bad business dealings or just fallouts on the billionaire level. These things are normally handled behind closed doors, but there are definitely some fundamental differences between Alice Rodriguez and his business partner versus Glenn Taylor. Not only there's an age gap difference, Glenn Taylor being 82, Mark Lurie being 52, and Alice Rodriguez being 48, but in the times that these men have acquired their wealth and how they acquired it, it's completely fundamentally different. Glenn Taylor not only having the 30 year difference in age, but he has the upper hand in 30 years of business dealings in an era when the American business landscape was more hands-on, more industrial, more, what should I say, more liquid. Men who controlled industry not only had employees that you could physically see get paid by the thousands, but they also have facilities that created product. Glenn Taylor has over 65 manufacturing facilities around the world. So this is business outside of just the inflated net worth of the Minnesota Timberwolves. Some of these things are more liquid. And you can see it play out no further than his workforce. He employs over 10,000 people outside of the Minnesota Timberwolves. But when you look at the tech business bubble in the past few years, companies like Facebook will really only employ about 200 people, but yet have the market cap and the evaluations of some countries. And a lot of these things tend to be tied up in inflated valuations in stocks. Again, keep in mind, we're in an era now where the billionaire status has become very similar to the Hollywood star in the Walk of Fame, in which now come to find out most people in the Walk of Fame made either some sort of donation or funded some sort of campaign pitch so they could be there. And it's very similar to the Forbes magazine and the billionaire status. And a perfect example of this is Forbes magazine giving Kylie Jenner the billionaire status. See, in today's landscape, these things are really marketing tools that can help a lot of these public figures get more sales or increase their net worth over time due to that visibility of just quote unquote getting the billionaire status. Glenn Taylor comes from an era where men of industry had their net worth tied up more into their assets or their ability to buy out their competition. And this part right here comes real handy in this story as Glenn Taylor over the years has acquired 187 companies. So he's used to eating up competition and he has all that history throughout all those transactions to kind of understand contract language, which is not the same history Mark Lurie and Alice Rodriguez have. A lot of their net worth is tied up to the venture capital money that they raised for a lot of the startups that they're involved in. But Alice Rodriguez and his partner Mark Lurie spoke about protecting their reputation ever since Glenn Taylor in the start of 2023 were on the attack about them not having enough funds to purchase the team. You guys check it out, and every once in a while, I'll check in. There are basically two dates in the contract. There was the date at the end of December to exercise the option. There was the date, uh, March 27th, to have submitted to the league, signed subscription agreements. There was an automatic 90-day uh, uh, time period that was triggered when we sent the stuff to the NBA by the 27th to give the NBA time to, to approve us. So we're just thinking that we're marching along. We had a great conversation with Glenn, Becky, saw them at the game, um, had a great text exchange with, with, with Glenn, and we're just absolutely surprised that we just basically got a nuclear bomb dropped on us on the 28th. Um, and, and there's really no basis whatsoever legally for, for breaking the contract. Um, we talked to Wachtell, which is our, our law firm, who tells us it's an ironclad contract um, you had 90 day extension aut automatically. Um, they never gave us any, uh, made us can be concerned even the slightest that this was a possibility. Uh, it's that crystal clear in, in, in the contract. And so we're just surprised, shocked that he would do this to the fans, to the city, to the players, right in the middle of this epic stretch run. 
um, and and just really really disappointed and think it's think it's selfish, and uh, and and really disingenuous. I couldn't say it better myself. I mean, we we were ready to close on March 27th. Uh, you know, the league still has to run their process. They have a board of governors meeting. I believe the eighth or the ninth, and the only thing left, uh, Dane and Kyle, is approval and funding. And uh, we're ready to do it now. We were ready to do it last week. Uh, we expressed this to Glenn Taylor. So to further elaborate what A-Rod said right here, they had a $300 million commitment from the Carlisle Group, a private equity firm, but the league did not approve it. So another pre-approved firm that the league already is used to dealing with is where A-Rod and Mark Lowry had pivoted to, but we're not sure if they actually submitted this paperwork in time. Now the details of this deal was them putting up 20%. And everything was agreed on in 2021. Keep in mind, interest rates were real low. Venture capital money was flowing around. The tech companies like Google, Facebook, Amazon, and just a lot of startups. They weren't really jumping through hoops back then to get funding. But now everything at Silicon Valley is flipped upside down, especially with interest rates going up. Assets like basketball teams are inflated. We've seen the Charlotte Hornets sell for $3 billion. So right then and there, you already know Glenn Taylor, his eyeballs are up. He's like, damn, my team is worth a lot more. These guys are struggling to make payments where the interest rate was already low to what we agreed back in 2021. Not only that, I'm selling the team for a lot less. I'm collecting a lot less interest. And just around the corner, after the NBA negotiates a brand new TV deal, they're going to expand to two other teams. So with the possibility of Vegas and Seattle coming in, once everything gets sold and created with those two franchises, the owners get a net sum of cash. So every owner right now, if, let's just say if the team sold for about $4 billion, they could be looking at $300 million check for each of them. So Glenn Taylor possibly is going to miss out on that money by selling the team. He undersold his team for about $2 billion. And at the same time, he's not collecting any interest. And these guys are still fucking struggling to make payments. Yeah, he's going to have an issue with that. A dollar today is not a dollar tomorrow. And that same dollar from 2021 is probably worth really like 75 cents today especially when you add on opportunity costs the time spent on not having that dollar to invest in 2021 of what it would made all the way in 2024 so taylor might have a little seller's remorse but at the same time these guys got to close this fucking deal they got to be on their p's and q's so going back to the initial details of their contract they were supposed to put down 20 percent up front at the start of this venture then they were supposed to put down another 20 percent in the beginning of 2023 and by the end of 2023 they're supposed to put down 40 percent so they already started fucking up by the time they were supposed to make their second payment of the 20 percent in early 2023 he very quickly replied to both of us thank you appreciate it glenn nice and short at that point mark and i said okay we did we complied by exactly our obligations glenn taylor acknowledged it we're ready to fund now we're just waiting on the nba approval and funding and his game set match and all of a sudden out of nowhere comes his nuclear bomb and, and by the way this all this should be done privately the only reason we're here is because we've been attacked and this is a childhood dream for mark and i and our lawyers tell us that we have an iron clad agreement and we'll never relent i mean we will fight for our dream we will fight for the fans of minnesota the team and really protect the fan base from from glenn taylor that was very interesting wording that Alex Rodriguez had used right there. Protect the fans from Glenn Taylor. Now, I'm not going to lie. Glenn Taylor has had a bad history of being an NBA owner. But again, the media games these guys are playing with one another, especially Glenn Taylor putting the word out there that these guys did not have enough money. But interesting words coming from A-Rod to protect the team from Glenn Taylor because the same private equity group that got rejected by the NBA that was supposed to help A-Rod and his business partner bring in about $300 million, their interest agreement actually had leaked out. Once again, the games that get played on this billion dollar level, it should be behind closed doors, but this is all spilling out. So the agreement between A-Rod and his business partner with that private equity was for them to reduce the salary of the T-Wolves starting in the summer of 2024. That was one of the things they laid out as far as them reducing expenses and making sure that this team remains profitable. And it wouldn't shock me if this paperwork leaked out from Glenn Taylor's side. But again, we're seeing the games that get played out in the billion dollar level. We're, we're emotionally connected. We, the last two and a half years, we put our heart and soul into this. 
and we think we helped get the team to a really good spot. You know, we're we're you know, vying for first place tonight with 10 games left. I mean, that's an incredible spot to be in. Um, you know, we can't take full credit for that, but certainly we're a big part of it. And uh, we want to bring a championship to Minnesota and, and we want to, you know, do w whatever we need to do and use all means possible to ensure that, that this is a smooth transition to, to control uh, of the team. Now, A-Rod and Mark Lurie have put in great effort into improving this Minnesota Timberwolves team as they went even as far as stretching out and recruiting Tim Connolly, the executive out in Denver who assembled that team with Jokic and Murray that end up winning the championship in 2023. But these guys were able to recruit Tim Connolly to becoming the president of basketball operations in Minnesota back in 2022, which has really worked out well for the Minnesota Timberwolves. But even though swaying Tim Connolly to join the Timberwolves was a great recruitment, at the end of the day, money talks. And A-Rod was asked about some of the tardy payments. I mean, we've complied with all our obligations, right? Um, you, you've heard a lot of noise, uh, Dane, around the last two tranches. Um, and trust me when I tell you this, if there was any issues, uh, Glenn Taylor would have stepped in and canceled the deal. But because there was no issues, you can scream, you can holler. At the end of the day, we closed. You can scream, yeah. you can holler. We closed. You can scream and holler a little louder now because the GP is changing. And this is his loudest scream because he knows if we go out and get approved, then it's game set match for him. So this is very predictable. But the last two tranches haven't been much different than this one, except not as loud because it was less recourse. But there was a lot of unnecessary noise and fabrication of a narrative. You know, we, we submitted, you know, uh, at the end of December, the option to exercise in both in both cases. And we had a, a um, you know, same thing here, 90 days. And, you know, in, in both those cases, we, we wired the money, um, you know, that we needed to wire on time. Alex and I, you know, 90. Now, once again, they had to make three different payments. So what payment is he, is he referring to? I'm pretty sure Mark Lurie right here is referring to the first set of payments that initial 20% down. But overall, the first two payments was $600 million in total. It should have been that. The thing that's playing out here is that last initial payment. And also when they had to put down the second 20%, there was an issue going on with them finding funding just for that part. We're not even talking about the final 40%. Once again, they were supposed to make three different payments. Initially, at the signing back in 2021, they were supposed to put 20% down. Then they were supposed to put a second 20% down, but delays kept on happening where that second 20% was due in February of 2023. So what went on for almost a year and a half? That took them so long to make that second 20% payment. And the final payment of the 40% of the $1.5 billion was due at the end of 2023. It got pushed back all the way for a due date of March 27th of 2024. So the initial deal was made all the way back in 2021 when interest rates were still relatively low. It's 2024. I mean, come on. This deal couldn't be any better for A-Rod and his partner. What's taking so long to close? Because throughout all these delays, we've even seen teams like the Charlotte Hornets sell for about $3 billion. So if the Hornets are worth that, what are the T-Wolves really worth? And the purchasing history doesn't really take that long. We've seen the Phoenix Suns owner purchase his team within a 60-day window. Same thing for the Milwaukee Bucks. We've seen Jimmy Haslam and his wife come in and purchase that team within a month turnaround. So almost three years at low interest rates. So all these delays start to look funny after a while. It's almost like these guys are making a 30-year mortgage on a team. It's either you have the money or you don't. A dollar today is not a dollar tomorrow. Come on, man. Percent of the cash in the first two tranches came from me and Alex personally. So it wasn't even, you know, we had we have one LP, a friend of ours um, that we brought in. Um, that whole narrative about us not having the money and, and all this stuff was just incorrect. Hey, what about Mark, the third let tranche? Add, let, let me add one more thing on the so so Dana, both okay. Mark and I have already invested hundreds of millions of dollars each, at least on this contract. So we're all in. I bought a home there. I'm going to be over 50 games. Tim Conley recently told me, because I've never seen an owner come to many games on the home and on the road. You're at Portland for crying out loud and in cow's country. 
but let me just tell you what's going to happen, right? The contract is exactly the same in quarters, right? 20%, 20%, 40% and 20 Next year around this time, you're going to hear that Mark and I don't have the money for the last tranche. And we're, December 27th, we're going to send a letter to the league and we're going to close on exactly pretty much the same date. But you won't hear as much because by that time, we should be the GPs already. But this is going to be the exact same thing. People are going to be confused around December, January, February, but it's exactly the same. And there's just misinformation out there, but we've played exactly by the law. We, we believe a contract in America, you have to honor it. So see right here, A-Rod is making a mistake right here. <laughs> Yo, Glenn Taylor is 82 years old, man. Over 187 companies he has purchased throughout his lifespan. He has a team of lawyers who have an understanding and just contract history overall, man. Like these guys will put language in there to get out of it. And right now it looks like Glenn Taylor might have an out in which he could leave A-Rod and his business partner owning about 40% of the team or just a little under that. But them just owning that small percentage of the team is actually going to leave them on the hook for any type of liabilities that comes the team's way such as luxury tax payments any revenue losses for the year that they have to cover a rod and his business partner will be liable according to the percentage of the team that they own so not only glenn taylor got his money let's just say they bought the team at 40 percent they made the first two payments what's that of a billion and a half dollars that's about 600 million so glenn taylor got an influx of 600 million in cash he got them also on the hook for any liabilities to the team he's still the majority controller and with the nba expansion coming through about a year from now he's going to be able to still cash in when all the other owners of the other 30 teams get paid out so it's a win-win and he also gets to participate in the team's inflationary value he purchased a team in 1994 for 94 million now in the last two years it went from 1.5 billion to about a three billion dollar valuation so this right here could be a complete win for taylor again his corporation outside of the minnesota timberwolves have purchased over 187 companies throughout its history and a lot of their assets are tangible so if anybody knows their way to finesse and finagle out of this deal it's going to be glenn taylor we don't see any benefit by closing three weeks early. He still would have figured out something that we tripped on so he can get the team back. Yeah, and, and Wachtel is happy to go on the record, go on air, talk to you guys. I mean, this is ironclad contract. This is somebody who just decided, you know, I'm going to break it and sue me. I don't know that. I've never been sued. I've never sued anyone. I don't know what that is like to just say. Wow. <laughs> I don't know if Mark Laurie right here is lying. You mean to tell me you've been involved as a person who sold subsidiaries and startups to Walmart and Amazon, and you've employed a ton of people, you've had HR departments, now you're entering the restaurant business, so you have even more employees, more HR, and you've never been sued? I find that very hard to believe. I'm just going to forget integrity, forget the, the partnership. I'm just going to break it and and say, sue me. Um, that that. It's not, it's not a game. You know what? Mark has probably never been sued, but his entities have been sued. Not necessarily him. So this is good wordplay right here. Of course, he could say, I've personally never been sued, but I'm pretty sure his companies, even from an HR standpoint, you definitely had to be been sued if you employ a bunch of people at least once or twice. Come on, Mark, you're 50 years old. You've been running these companies for years. Um, he apparently does know that well, and he's playing it again. Um, but why would we, you know, feel like the, the need to do it earlier if we thought everything was 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 sort of by the book? Um, we, we gave Carlisle, you know, time to work through uh, the NBA approval. We had a backup plan in case that didn't happen. We wanted to give Carlisle an, as much time as possible to, to try and get a positive result. And at some point we had to say, I'm really sorry, but, you know, we, we need to enact sort of our, our uh, backup plan, which we did on, on the 21st. So um, we were just being nice and, and trying to, you know, uh, give them an opportunity to, to get there with the NBA. And 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 by the way, we were talking to, to, to Dow Capital for over two years. So, like, they were ready to go. They were chomping at the bid. When we called them, like, 
Now, Dow Capital is a private equity firm that has already been pre-approved by the NBA. So a lot of limited partners that are trying to make the full purchase of these teams and they need a little funding, the NBA is really used to dealing with that firm. But once again, people at A-Rod said we were talking to Dial Capital for two years. That means they were seeking funding for two years on an agreement for a purchase that was made back in 2021. So just through this statement alone, you already see that they did not have the funds. They're hopping around from equity group to equity group as they were with the Carlisle group at first who committed $300 million to this whole venture, but the NBA did not approve of that private equity firm. So that's why they went with Dow Capital. And by the way, we were talking to, to, to Dow Capital for over two years. So like they were ready to go. They were chomping at the bid. When we called them, they were like, great, we're ready, let's go. Have just in general, like have you and Alex spoken yet to Adam Silver or anyone in the league about this in the last 24 hours since this, this nuclear bomb was kind of dropped? So I, I think, listen, we're, we're taking advice from Wachtell on how to exactly how to approach this. I think the, the league is in a tough situation because they... Now, Wachtell is a law firm. That's the law firm they're taking advice from. We, you know, have never had this situation before. Normally, the buyer and the seller bring it to the league and they present uh, the deal and then it goes for approval. But if you've got one owner saying, I don't want to sell the team and it's my team, um, and, and, and buyers say, no, you're in breach, it puts them in a difficult situation. So I think we want to be delicate. We don't want to cause problems for the NBA, problems for the league and make this, you know, into, into a bigger thing than it already is. We just want, um, you know, our legal rights to be enforced. And that's what we're going to, to do. We just need to, to, to figure out exactly how to do that with our, uh, with our law firm, Wachtell. But once again, that law firm is going to have one hell of a task on their hands because Glenn Taylor and his lawyers have history of buying over 187 companies. So you can only imagine out of those 187, which ones were good deals, bad deals, which ones were muscle deals. Like they sort of muscled their competition out. Like I said, we're getting a peek behind the curtain of some of the battles that goes on on the billionaire level. And we're seeing these sub levels within that billionaire class actually compete and clash with one another. All this really should have been playing out behind closed doors. But A-Rod and Mark were asked about their current relationship with the team. As in the beginning phases of this endeavor, they were actually allowed to call certain shots. Even though they only put 20% down on the team, they were able to get a presidential suite within the arena constructed. They were able to choose the president of basketball operations. Glenn Taylor kind of gave him free range to operate even though they didn't quite put down the equity to be doing so but now that things have fallen out glenn is beginning to pull back the curtain to the point where they're not even allowed in the arena but they spoke about it you guys check it out and every once in a while I'll check in well one, one of the things as part of this nuclear bomb that we've got um it's even 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 bigger than just you know saying that uh you know we, we can't have have the team he's shut us out from conversations with any of the employees of the team um, with Tim Conley, with the players. He said we couldn't go into the suite. We couldn't go to certain walk at certain places within the arena. Which makes sense. This is all legal. This is actually part of being a limited partner. For all those little micro owners of these NBA teams, none of them could do that. There's certain places they can't go. They can't talk to certain personnel. They can't be in certain rooms or certain decisions are being made. This is all part of being a limited partner when it comes to owning an NBA team. And Glenn Taylor seems like he's finally putting Mark Laurie and A-Rod in their proper role as being limited partners. He granted them free range and it's clearly obvious that the business dwellings when it comes to making the payments, it's been iffy. Um, so he's, he's really gone nuclear on us and it just feels very... No, he's actually put you guys into your proper roles as limited partners. But once again, you see the media games being played. Mark Lurie knows he has not gone nuclear. He's actually reduced us to the proper roles that we are as two business partners who only own about 40% of the team. If at that. Hurtful. I mean, I don't know what other word. I mean, we, we were partners in this. We, we together built the team that is, you know, um, vying for first place, 10 games to go in the season. I mean, it's an incredible story. And we thought we, we, we did this together. And, and, um, and then next thing you know, we wake up and we can't bring our family <laughs> to the games. It, it's sort of... Once again, the wordplay, we can't bring our families to the games. They can go to the games as limited partners. 
but that luxury suite that they had built and all that quote unquote ownership access that they had without putting the real money down that shit is gone man but crazy um it's, it's and, never and, and Mark, the lack of judgment of of what he's doing is, is if that's not bad enough the fact to be tone deaf enough that to do this bomb on the eve of what could be the most important game in franchise history at least from a regular season game at least over the last five years and not do this privately just tells you kind of where his state of mind is and that's unfortunate mark to your comment about kind of being frozen out since this nuclear bomb was dropped um just how does that in your mind and alex in your mind compared to, you know, part of that statement yesterday was I will continue to work with Mark and Alex and the rest of the ownership group to ensure our teams have the necessary resources. That's pretty much not the truth, then, not right? That is the truth. <laughs> the necessary resources. You see any liabilities of the T-Wolves now falls on these guys as limited partners. That is the responsibility of them now. They did not make the full payment, so now they fall in line with the other limited partners of the Minnesota Timberwolves. And this applies to all the teams in the NBA, especially when you see celebrities like Usher own a percentage of the Cleveland Cavaliers. This falls under his responsibility. Any losses the team takes, any luxury tax payments, whatever percentage of the team that they own is gonna be the same percentage in any liabilities that come to the team. So Glenn Taylor was right in that statement. And let's not peep the double finesse. Not only these two guys are on the hook for any liabilities, Glenn Taylor actually used them and their charisma to recruit high-end executives to work in Minnesota and possibly to even get certain guys to sign extensions. As we've seen this season, they were able to extend Mike Connolly and Jaden McDaniels. So it wouldn't shock me if Glenn Taylor used the charisma of these two guys potentially being the new owners to maintain certain people in that work environment. It was already shocking enough they were able to pull Tim Connolly to leave the Denver Nuggets organization that was set up for success for the next five to six years to go work for the Minnesota Timberwolves. So again, it wouldn't be shocking if Glenn Taylor pulled the double finesse. The memo was sent out to everybody in the organization not to talk to us and in uh, and, and places that we couldn't go uh, in the arena specifically. So that's next level. You know, I mean, it's a nuclear bomb for sure, the contract, but then that's next level to, to sort of um, be so disrespectful as to, as to, as to say those things. Um, How was your relationship with Glenn gone over the course of, of the three years? Have there been ups and downs or is this your well, first? Cause you guys are clearly upset right now. Like I can start Dana. I mean, look, besides the eight months ago or so when he gave us a Heisman to kind of, you know, stand down which we did because we want to be respectful to him as always uh me personally i would check in with with glenn uh, at least once a week i'll get him on the phone you know every two or three weeks just to check in nothing kind of tell him a little bit about what mark and i are up to ideas a little bit about the team small talk but just really respectful so we we both thought that the relationship was solid i mean it's not like we're not we don't have to be best friends like mark and i but we thought it was solid that's why this bomb he threw yesterday was such a shock and surprise and especially when you put the timing and then icing us out of the building right that that just seems like it's it's not a really nice thing to do to another human being i mean there's also just a, an integrity issue right like we we paid the control premium so 1.5 was the control price not an lp price we paid the control premium on the first tranche we paid the control premium on the second tranche and then we're, we're now it comes to control and he's like thank you very much i'm breaking the contract your lps it's like wait a second <laughs> that just from an, a the straight up integrity standpoint once again why did it take so long for the second payment the issues regarding the second payment fell all the way in february 2023 that's when rumbling started coming about but the initial deal was struck in 2021 like you know, that, that is, 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 I mean, we have the contract on our side, but just put the contract aside for a second, just straight up integrity. Like we help build this franchise to where it is. It's winning. We're, we're winning together. Um, we paid the control premium on the first two tranches. And now come on, Mark, <laughs> you know, better than that. For starters, you got the team at a low ball price at 1.5. Second of all, not only you lock the team for a low ball price, you locked it at an interest rate. That's much lower in 2021 versus current day. And the final thing is, you guys are well aware after the TV deal that the two expansion franchises 
whoever buys them are going to end up cutting all the previous owners a check that they don't have to share with the players. It just goes directly to the owners. So this deal couldn't have worked out any sweeter for you. All you had to do is just make the payments on time. And a business deal is a business deal. And the longer this kept on stalling for you guys to purchase the team, the worse it got for Glenn Taylor to explain to his other partners of why you guys are buying the team at such a low price. None of it made sense in a business level for Glenn Taylor. You can't come to the arena like and, and, and also also guys like it's like the spirit of a deal if you're buying a house that costs two hundred thousand dollars and you have a, a two-year payment or a two-year whatever and that house is worth double you, you can go back and say you know what we want to take that house back it just doesn't work i mean you can if motherfuckers making payments too late <laughs> the bank could take that house back yes they can who does that and if the spirit of the deal is to get the deal done versus looking for any hiccup so he can take the team back that, that's just not good intention it's also not good integrity It's also not the in, the intention of what the spirit of this deal was and on top of that thank god there's a lot of morality talk coming from a rod <laughs> none of those things apply in business again you're dealing with an 82 year old billionaire who has major investment in minnesota itself he was involved in politics over there I believe he is the wealthiest person from Minnesota. So just him owning the team might mean a little bit more to him than just having that real estate. We have an ironclad contract. Why well, would it even, uh, imagine can, can I ask about that, Mark? So th there's there's a bit a lot of the, the phrase handshake deal that's popped up surrounding this at, at different times from back to Naples when you guys initially met with with Glenn and Becky. You are saying that all of this had was documented documented in contracts from the jump signed sealed waiting to be delivered there yeah, was nothing everything it, anything ambiguous in your no, mind. there's nothing ambiguous the contract is, is is clear cut i think the handshake is sort of like the the addition in, in addition to the contract there's that you know partnership handshake where it's like we're going to do this together and there might be some ups and downs but we're doing this together and we're never going to look at the contract again like that's what that's what a handshake deal means. It means, yeah, we have a contract, but we're never going to look at it. Right. Um, and 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 so that's why it's such a shock, because he never once said to us anything that would suggest that he would he was capable of doing something like this. And especially in light of like the fact that we've been respect, respectful, we did stand down, we did, you know, uh, you know, drive a lot of the success in, in, in bringing in Tim Conley. Um, and all the moves that he's made. And like, there's a lot of things that we, we we worked on behind the scenes around culture, around VCP with Ethan and Ryan. And it was really only, you know, eight or nine months ago that we, you know, after he asked us to stand down through his his his, his person, we, 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 we did. We said, it's okay, we, we understand. And even though it's gonna be our team and some of these decisions will impact the team, we said, fine, it's okay. Like there's never any bad blood. It was more just being respectful of, hey, maybe maybe we did, do too many things, you know, to push this team forward. He is the control owner, so we we, we backed off. Um, yeah, and and Dan and, and Kyle, what, one thing to note is another part of the handshake agreement is there has to be trust in any partnership. You're not going to put everything in a contract, right? Uh, there has to be a spirit of trust, and and we believe trust is a very important element in any bar partnership. He did not agree with the Rudy. He warned us against it. He he did not want to do that deal. Okay. He let us do it, so credit to him. Okay, he didn't get in our way. The big one was Tim Conley. He his quote to to Mark and I was, "Why are you wasting your time? People like Tim Conley do not come here." Okay, we said, "Let us take a crack at it." Mark and I went to work on it. Three months later, we're having a press conference at a practice facility. Right there again, that's part of the double finesse. I wouldn't be shocked if Glenn Taylor saw some of the charisma that these guys had, and after locking down Tim Conley transferring some of that energy into the player personnel side to get Mike Connolly and Jaden McDaniels to re-sign. To take all the credit now is not only disingenuous, but it's a plain lie. And I'm shocked by the way, how comfortable he is making these statements. Keep in mind, we're at a huge disadvantage being LPs with the NBA rules. We're, we're, we're not able to say as much on the record as, as Glenn can as the control owner of the team, you know? I think along the way we've been sitting in, in the background and things are coming out, but we're being very sensitive, not causing problems with the NBA, not wanting to get caught up in drama, 
we, we just thought, hey, Glenn's our partner. The press is the press. We know who's doing it. Um, and, and it's just going to play out. It'll take control and all this will be over. So it didn't really seem necessary and it didn't seem to take on that that risk of of upsetting the NBA in any way or doing anything we weren't supposed to yeah. do as, as LPs. Um, I think we've we come on the record now today um, because you know, we should be the control owner of this team and uh, and we have to defend ourselves. And now it's 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 pushed beyond the point of being able to sit back and, and just let the press do it. Do what it does. Yeah. And Dane and Kyle, what we've done is we, we've taken the approach collectively, Mark and I, like we're, we're juniors in high school, right? We know that our time's going to come and we're going to be seniors and we'll get to go to senior prom or whatever. <laughs> but we want to be respectful, A, to the NBA and B, to Glenn Taylor, because you know what? He's older than us. He's had a tremendous business career. He's been there for 30 years. To his credit, he's wanted to keep the team there. And I think for that, I give him a lot of credit. But the only thing that has gone wrong in our deal and just make it very clear, the team is worth a lot more than $1.5 billion, and he has a problem with that. And he's embarrassed to his LPs that are putting a tremendous amount of pressure on him, which he admitted yesterday in his press tour. As he should. As he should. See, here's another conundrum. You can imagine Glenn Taylor as an 82-year-old billionaire explaining to his other investors of why is it that he's getting finessed by two guys half his age. But it was fair value when the deal was struck. That's the, that's that's the thing. Like like you said on a, on a house mortgage, you can't you give a mortgage on a house, <laughs> it's your house, right? And 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 you can't take it back if the house goes up in value. And he, we signed a deal where it escalated four percent per year, which was, by the way, a lot higher than the one percent interest that we were at back in in in, in twenty twenty one, and it was a fair deal, and everyone was very happy with the deal, and we worked our butts off to help, you know, build value in the team. Um, I, I don't even think we anticipated this quickly to be this successful, but I think Tim has just done a phenomenal job. I mean, literally, you know, built a, a, a world-class team in a very short period of time. And, uh, you know, the, the valuation's gone up and and it is what it is. And and we benefit uh, from from striking that deal, but it wasn't, we, it wasn't an unfair deal that we struck at the time we struck it. It was just the yeah, opposite. And, and Mark, let, let me remind the guys, because we, we haven't really talked to them uh, on or off the record. But just to be clear, Dan and Kyle, we were ready to close that deal as is. Glenn Taylor said, I would love to be in control for two and a half years. So then we structured a four-year payout. Why would we pay 100% up front and let him be in control for two and a half years? And that's exactly what we did. And we've played it. It exactly. wasn't your idea. It was his ideas. What yeah, because he saying. wanted to yep. be in control, Dane. That's, that's why a lot of other uh, teams that were wanting to buy from Glenn Taylor, a lot of other pursuers, couldn't get there because they wanted him in and get him out, right? right? And we were saying, okay, fine. You know what? This is actually a benefit. We can learn from Glenn Taylor. And, and by the way, we have learned a lot from Glenn Taylor. That's why it's so disappointing that we've been so gracious and we've done everything by the book. And when he told us to back up, we backed off because we're juniors, not seniors. But now it's time to pass the baton, man. It's time to pass it. Now, A-Rod right there might be a little bit disingenuous because Glenn Taylor has been putting up this team for sale for the last 20 years. And he's already had history of having a few dust-ups with other people trying to make the purchase of the Timberwolves. And Alice Rodriguez and Mark Laurie said in the beginning of this interview, that they were warned about doing business with Glenn Taylor. So yes, they did elect on skipping out, making a 100% payment and letting Glenn Taylor control the team for two and a half years in order to stretch out the payments in a four-year stretch. But at the same time, these guys are hopping around from private equity firm to private equity firm within those four years. So them stretching out the payments really helped them out. But unfortunately for them, Glenn Taylor, he went back to his old finessing ways and just seeing the interest rates is go up and inflation doing the same, particularly for sports franchise assets, the deal over time just didn't really make sense for him to complete it. And it's not shocking that he tried to find any type of wiggle room to get out of this deal, while at the same time using these guys' charisma to recruit a highly ranking president of basketball operations to work within this franchise, and at the same time leaving A-Rod and Mark Lurie on the hook for any liabilities on this team as a limited partner it looks like chef curry's not the only one cooking it up in these basketball streets <laughs> glenn taylor working that spatula boy because he flipped this deal in a complete 180 
So former Miami Marlins president David Sampson spoke on the business dealings with Alice Rodriguez. As previously, he tried to purchase the Marlins, but to no avail, didn't have enough money. He gave some great insights as it pertains to his situation, and he wasn't surprised that this really didn't work out. You guys check it out, and every once in a while, I'll check in. So let's take people back before he was having illegal practices in Minnesota, before he bought a house and pretended he was from Minnesota. He agreed to buy the Timberwolves at a price of $1.5 billion in 2021, but it was something called a step transaction. A step transaction means you lock in the value today, but you pay over time. And there are deadlines contained within the purchase agreement that you have to make your next installment payment by a certain day. And A-Rod has missed just about every deadline. And Glenn Taylor has been okay. He said, hey, we'll extend the deadline. Don't worry about it. But meanwhile, the price of basketball teams have skyrocketed since 2021. So the Timberwolves are no longer worth 1.5. Let's say they're worth about 2.5. So that means that Glenn Taylor feels terribly that he sold the team at one and a half when he could have sold it at two and a half. But he was in a contract, nothing he could do until A-Rod missed another deadline. And there were rumors that the Carlisle group pulled out and then 10 minutes later, A-Rod had another deal with another private equity company, and it was all horse hockey. A-Rod has never been able to come up with the money to finish this transaction. So today, Glenn Taylor said, Gnug, guess what, Alex? The team's not for sale anymore. You violated the contract. What he also said in the release is, hey, if they want to come back and talk, we can keep talking about selling the team. But guess what? an official wait to see here on Levitard show, courtesy of nothing personal. If the team is sold again by Glenn Taylor to, Glenn Taylor to A-Rod, it won't be for 1.5. Cause I've been calling this for two years because I negotiated with A-Rod to buy the Marlins and he had everything except the money. Huh. And so it was always going to be an issue and he wants to be an owner so badly that he pretended he wanted to be in Minnesota, but he never was able to hit a deadline. And finally, Glenn Taylor said, you know what? It's cool that you're A-Rod, but money's way more important. What, what was Mark Laurie's role if not to be the money? Mark Laurie was brought in to be a percentage of the money, but he had given his allocation at the first go around. So he was never going to be part of the increased uh, finishing the installments. It always had to be OPM, other people's money. And A-Rod's been out raising money for years and just has been unable to do it. And here's why. A-Rod could have borrowed money and gotten investors at the $1.5 billion number, but A-Rod always was trying to make a Beckham-like profit like Beckham did in Inter-Miami. He was selling pieces of the team at numbers higher than 1.5, and people were like, hey, why do you get this incredible benefit of having such a low basis? And now it's all done. A-Rod was never going to get that type of leveraging power that Beckham got here in the States. Beckham was the face of soccer here in the States at some point, trying to elevate the, the sport. And the initial buy-in for MLS teams were at a low enough price for guys to make a profit. NBA teams, ever since A-Rod struck this deal in 2021, prices just keep going higher and higher. The owners who came in and made those purchases locked up those teams within a 60-day window. That's pretty much been the trend. And the teams that were purchased, those was for way more than $1.5 billion. I mean, the Suns were purchased for four. The Milwaukee Bucks were purchased for three. Same thing for the Dallas Mavericks. So A-Rod right here looks like the odd man out. But David Sampson further elaborates on how A-Rod and his business partner are now minority owners. And again, like I said before, Glenn Taylor, he's good at flipping shit with the spatula. Because this deal took a complete 180. And now he's highly favored. He is a minority owner. There's two ways it can go. They can, and you have to look at the contract. So contracts can have two different provisions. One can be that if any installment payment is not made, then the entire contract is void and the money gets returned to the investor, in this case, A-Rod. It can be returned with a premium. They can maybe go to appraisal if the team is worth more since the first sale. So Glenn Taylor has to give A-Rod a little bit more for his money to get that money back. 
or it can be that A-Rod stays at a li as a limited partner with the percentage he already owned because he made those first installments. So I don't know what the contract says, but it's one of those two things. So it wouldn't be a bad deal if they got their money back. They would get it at the inflation price that happened in between 2021 to 2024. But what there's a yin, there's a yang. If the Minnesota Timberwolves next season, especially with Carl Anthony Towns' contract, go over the luxury tax threshold and any team net losses or just any penalties occur, A-Rod and his business partner will be on the hook for those liabilities according to the percentage of the team that they own. Now, as these teams' evaluations keep climbing higher and higher, at some point, there's not going to be enough people to come in and close out these purchases within a 60 to 90 day window. So this is where the NBA finds itself in a conundrum because at some point they're going to want to welcome in private equity funds or just hedge funds to come in and buy up these teams so the evaluations could continue climbing up higher and higher. But David Samsung gives us some insight on how it normally works when owners come in who have enough equity to close out these deals. Well, listen, the number one straightforward of all time was Steve Ballmer. Yeah, cash. He, he went to the ATM, took out a couple bill. Sterling was gone. Ballmer was in. It was a dream come true for Adam Silver. But the number of people in the world who can do transactions like that is very, very small. So when the value of the assets of these teams continues to increase, you need groups of people. Like Bruce Sherman has a group of 10 or 20 people helping him do the Marlins transaction. When you look at what David Rubenstein just did with the Orioles, they listed all of the limited partners. You're putting together 20 million pieces of 20 million each. You need a lot of money, which is why the NFL is looking into allowing sovereign fund money and basketball and baseball already do allow it because you want to keep the value of teams increasing. To do that, you have to find big chunks of change from people who don't want control. And in the real world, an individual doesn't want to give you $300 million toward the purchase of a team and not be allowed in the clubhouse or not be allowed in an owner's meeting or not be allowed to make a trade. That's exactly the position Alex Rodriguez and Mark Lurie find themselves in right now. And this is all after they already gave $600 million. It's super hard to put these deals together now. I think you have to look to see who the governor is in with Cuban and in the Mavericks. And I'll bet you a dollar the governor is not Mark Cuban anymore. It is the son of, I think her name was Miriam Edelson. Mm -hmm. So what's interesting, George Steinbrenner once said something to me because what he said was important. And it, for him to say it, there's nothing more limiting than being my limited partner. Well, with A-Rod, it seems like he had issues finding a private equity group that the league would approve. As right here, we're going to get some insight to some of the reasoning of why the initial private equity group who pledged $300 million was rejected or allegedly was. Because eventually, come to find out, there are rumors going around that this group actually pulled out of the deal. Now, David, one of the things you mentioned, the Carlisle Group earlier, that was the original team that, uh, excuse me, the original firm that A-Rod had secured financing through. Axios had come out with uh, a report saying that they were out because some of the stuff in their portfolio ran afoul of the NBA uh, guidelines, bylines, whatever, <laughs> right? There's another report that came out and said, no, no, they weren't denied. They pulled out. I, either way, I don't care what the truth is. I just do want to know for a sports league, a major league sports uh in, you know, like like MLB, like the NBA, what would be the type of things that would be in these rules and guidelines where someone else's portfolio would run afoul of? Well, funny, it used to be gambling. Yeah. That was the big thing that they looked for, that if anyone was associated with any sort of casino or gambling, they were not eligible to be a limited partner. There is tremendous background checks that go in when you become a limited partner in baseball. There is full background, full check on who you are, who you're associated with. You've got to pass through the ownership committee, the executive council, then the full vote of the owners in Major League Baseball to say nothing of the commissioner's office. So they're looking for any dealings. But let's be honest, Steve Cohn's background wasn't exactly perfect. He had been in the middle of some major suits, some major workplace issues, some major SEC violations. And guess what? If the price is right, Bob Barker, we're going to find a way to approve you. And so 
I believe that Carlisle pulled out and it's not that the NBA turned them down because these leagues know now that when you find chunks of change, you really need to, you need to take it hmm. because the commissioner who wants his job and wants to keep his job, wants to keep the value of the teams going up. And to do that, you need lots of people with lots of money. And speaking of the commissioner, Adam Silver was asked about whether the league had jurisdictions to intervene in this whole situation. Um, where do things stand with the situation with the sale of the Timberwolves? And is, at what point would the league get involved with that? It, it, it's not clear whether there will be a role for the league to get involved. Where it stands is uh, Glenn Taylor on one hand as the seller of the franchise, and then with Mark Laurie and Alex Rodriguez as, as the buyers, they have a purchase agreement. And there's a dispute now in the purchase agreement. And in their purchase agreement, they, in essence, pre-agreed to a dispute resolution mechanism that includes mediation and arbitration. And that's where it stands. There is no role for the league in that process. AKA Adam Silver works for Glenn Taylor. And this scenario is actually going to play out according to the contract. And if I was a betting man, I would say Glenn Taylor is going to come out on top. But Adam Silver was also asked about the claims that A-Rod and Mark Laurie made about the NBA's pending approval would trigger an extra 90-day extension into that contract. Two quick Timberwolves questions. Um, one, Alex and Mark have said that the only thing holding up their deal was NBA approval of the financing and, and the money. Can you clarify or confirm exactly where that stood when Glenn announced that the deal, in his view, was off? I, I, I can't say more other than that comment is at the heart of their dispute. You know, and again, it, the, the, the dispute is, to, is precisely that, as to whether um, they had acted within the window that, of the option that, that, Grant, that Glenn Taylor had sold them. I mean, that, that's the very basis of the dispute. And so that dispute will be resolved independent of the league office. Got it. And then secondly, this was an atypical deal from the outset. They had not raised the money. Glenn wanted three years path to control. Is this a deal structure the NBA would approve in the future, or is it, does this necessitate a rethink about what, what types of structures allow you to buy NBA teams moving forward? Is it, that's an important question. I, I think this deal happened in the early days of the pandemic um, when um, it was extraordinary circumstances. And keep in mind, the league did borrow over $800 million during the pandemic to keep some of the teams afloat. They were able to secure a low interest rate from one of their, it's either advertising partner, they didn't really elaborate on who it was, but it's already a company that works with the NBA. And at the same time, they're very institutional. They're accredited investors. So the NBA got some help staying afloat. Things were iffy during the pandemic because a lot of teams were already losing money before then, like the Detroit Pistons. But now with the rate of inflation going up the way it has, a lot of the assets have gone up in value, particularly sports leagues as well as the franchises. And the impact has been so great that it has even had a trickle-down effect. We see leagues like the WNBA and the MLS have gone way up in value. For everyone um, in, in our community, um, it, it, I think lessons learned too, that as new situations evolve in the league as to what kind of transactions make sense, I think let's, let's wait to see um, how this one works out. But it's, it's certainly not ideal to have a stepped transaction like this. I mean, it, it, it met our rules from that standpoint. Um, but, but, you know, and, and it's what Glenn Taylor wanted and it's what they were willing to agree to at the time. But I think once the dust clears, you know, on this deal, it may cause us to, to reassess um, what sort of transactions we should allow. So there you have it. A dollar today is in a dollar tomorrow. And a situation like this normally would play out behind the scenes, but we're getting a peek of some of the battles that goes on with the different tiers of billionaires, quote unquote. And from the outside looking in, it looks like the old timer of Glenn Taylor at the age of 82 is not going to allow himself to get finessed by two multimillionaires whose net worths definitely got a boost through startup evaluations. But at the end of the day, it's only a fraction in comparison to someone who has tangible assets not only throughout the world, and also has an employee base outside of the Minnesota Timberwolves of 10,000 people. Some of the biggest tech companies of today don't even employ more than 300 people, i.e. Facebook. But hey, this is a multi-layer situation ranging from 
the old industrial billionaire versus the tech billionaire who has high net worth evaluation based off his company's stock or just speculation. And at the same time, inflation comes into play, especially after the last few years. The values of NBA franchises climbing up so high that the league might have to reconsider and allow private equity to come in to buy up some of these teams. But when it comes to Glenn Taylor, he definitely flipped the switch on Mark Laurie and Alex Rodriguez as it looked like they had the upper hand. But now not only he was able to secure an influx of cash, but also sharing the liability of the impending luxury tax that's going to hit the T-Wolves next offseason if they keep Carl Anthony Towns. The games that get played on the billionaire level, this is something to be said.